You know, I don't know how many times I've heard somebody say, man, if I'd only known it was going to be like this, I never would have started. If I'd only known that maintaining a marriage would prove to be this hard, or if I'd only known that raising kids would be this much of a challenge, if I'd only known that getting older would hurt this much, I don't know if I ever would have started. That is the voice of regret. And it happens because what you don't really understand when you're at the starting line of your life is that there's no way to predict what the journey ahead is actually going to look like. And you have no idea when you're going to cross the finish line or what you're going to look like when you get there. Today on Authentic, learning how to live your life with no regrets. Take a few minutes off from your life with me today and let's go back and just visit your childhood. If you happen to be from my generation or even a little older than that, you've seen a lot of change in a very short space of time. I actually grew up in a world where I walked to school unattended, if you can imagine that. And the technology they had for my education, it was a mimeograph machine and a film strip projector. In fact, I can still hear the rhythmic sound of test papers being reproduced on a Gestetner in the teacher's lounge. This is a technology that connected my generation to the 19th century. And if they dropped the copies on your desk soon enough, man, you could still smell the copying fluid. I still think that's one of the nicest smells in the whole world. The teachers all had dirty white smudges on their pants pockets because well, they were still using chalkboards, another primitive technology. And that chalk dust would get all over their hands and so it would get all over their clothes. And there was always some poor kid outside after school standing in a cloud of chalk dust because it was his job to clap the brushes together to make them clean again for tomorrow. Maybe some of you remember being sent up to the board to demonstrate a math problem for the whole class and you had to dig around in all those little chalk nubs sitting in the aluminum tray. And, and I don't know if this ever happened to you, but sometimes I would actually get a uh, shiver down my spine as I pulled one of those dry, tiny stubs across a dry green board and it would chatter for a second or even ugh, make a squeaking sound. Back then, when you wanted to make a phone call, you had to use this clunky machine you rented from the phone company. And it either sat on the kitchen counter or it was mounted to the wall. And if you wanted any privacy, you had to install a 40-foot coiled-up cord that always got tangled and kinked so that you could walk to the next room in order that nobody else could hear your conversation. If you were making a long-distance call, especially to another country, well, you had to wait until 11 p.m. because that's when the rates would suddenly drop and you wouldn't break the bank by talking to somebody for 10 or 15 minutes. In fact, back then, we still had family living in the old country, in Europe, and they still used telegrams when I was a kid to send the occasional message because it was cheaper than using the phone. Man, I, I don't even know if telegrams still exist. Now, I, I'm sure when I was a kid, cable TV must have existed in a few large urban places. I, I don't know, but I know we sure didn't have it. Not in my little town. We had black and white TVs with rabbit ear antennas that sometimes had foil wrapped around them, or if one of them got broken and had a coat hanger jammed in the end. Rich people had 20-inch TVs. Lots of people had much smaller screens than that, like 13 inches. And, and the TV stations? We only had two. And they would play the national anthem at midnight, and then they would actually shut off until morning, putting up color bars for the whole night. Of course, we, al we also had radio, which was kind of like our version of the internet back in the day, I guess. Back where I lived, we, we got two, maybe three stations on the AM dial, e except in the winter, when occasionally we'd suddenly get these long distance signals bouncing into town for just a few hours. And as a kid, I had this little red transistor AM radio. And I'd crawl into bed and scan the dial for something new, something from some other part of the world I could listen to. And because I wasn't supposed to be listening to the radio after bedtime, 
Well, I would cheat. I would use a little twisted mono earpiece, no stereo, a mono earpiece that you could plug into the back of the radio. And I'd crawl under the blankets and I would listen privately. My generation, we had no air conditioning, not in the house and certainly not in the car. So in the summertime, my brothers and I would sit in the suffocating heat at the back of my parents' van, slowly baking to death until the day my dad actually put a vent in the roof so we could get a little bit of air. And, and, and while we're talking about cars, most of us, believe this or not, most of us never wore seat belts. <laughs> my brothers and I actually sat on a foam mattress my dad put in the back of the van. And at one point, my parents even strapped a playpen to the floor of a VW van so my youngest brother could ride around town in a playpen. And I know what some of you are probably thinking, man, that sounds like, Child abuse. Way back then, nobody thought that way because we were all doing it. And frankly, our childhood, it wasn't the nerf padded childhood that some kids have to suffer through today. We just kind of assumed back then that bumps and bruises and broken bones were part of a normal childhood, part of the way that you learn about the real world and its physical limitations before the price of making mistakes begins to get too high and it ruins your life in adulthood. When we were kids, we played dangerously. We played with pocket knives and with homemade bows and arrows and with BB guns and even with fire and nobody batted an eyelash. I mean, yeah, okay, sometimes kids got hurt. I won't deny that it happened, but in other ways, I think it helped us grow up just a little bit faster. And it gave us an understanding that choices really do come with consequences. And somewhere out there, Back in the 1970s, my future spouse, my bride, was just a little girl playing with her friends, learning the same kinds of lessons, and I had no idea who she was. I knew that someday I'd probably get married because most people do, but I had no idea who my wife was, where she was, what she was like, or how the unexpected plot twists of life would eventually land me on her parents' doorstep. I mean, how in the world can you possibly know as you walk through a door for the very first time that you are minutes away from actually meeting your wife? What, what if I'd refused the invitation to visit that house on that particular day? Who in the world would I have married in, in that case? And how would that have changed my entire life? Now, look, I've, I've got to tell you, and, and if you've lived some, you know this. There is no way you can predict your life from the beginning. And even though I've probably blown through two-thirds of my life already at, at least, I'm starting to understand that there's no way I can predict the rest of it. I might, you might think you have a plan, but I can promise you, you don't, not, not really. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't make plans. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't pick a college major or plan for your career or start saving for retirement because you don't want to get to the latter part of your life without a plan either. After all, the wise man who wrote the book of Proverbs warned us to be diligent in Proverbs chapter 6. Listen to this. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O oh sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. So yeah, you need to make plans. That's not really what I'm getting at. What I'm saying is that you really don't have a detailed roadmap of where you're going to go. And life has this way of reminding you that you are not really in charge of your destiny, not the way that you hope you are. Now, honestly, that's probably a good thing because the reward you get from living this life might not be any particular destination. The reward might be the actual joy of just living it. So, Stick around. I'm going to come right back and we're going to explore your childhood just a little bit more. And I think you're going to find this pretty interesting. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. 
Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. You know, looking back from where I sit right now, it turns out that my present life, my existence, is nothing like I thought it was going to be when I was a kid. Growing up in a remote Canadian town, actually I don't think we could qualify as a city, we were too small. I had no idea back then I'd be sitting here today right now talking to you from the state of Colorado. I think I always knew somehow one day I'd be an American. I, I don't know how I knew that, but I did. There was just no way for me to predict the path I was going to take. How was that going to happen? So, no. The future was nothing like I expected. I was born in the early years of space exploration, making my entrance into the world about the same time that Neil Armstrong left a footprint on the moon. I remember actually saving the front page of the newspaper back in 1981 when the first space shuttle was launched. And now that program has already come and gone. It's, it's, it's done. Long before that, I, I collected all these books as a kid about space exploration. I still have them somewhere down in the basement. I tried to find them for the show today so I could show you. I kept all them because it seemed obvious to me when I was a boy that we were perched on the edge of a bright new era where the sky literally was no longer the limit. Somewhere that stuff is still there. I wish I could find it all. I have a postage stamp from 1969 that celebrates the moon landing. I actually have a medallion they gave the employees at Cape Canaveral the day that the moon landing happened. I have all sorts of things that I saved as a boy because they promised me well, they promised me the Jetsons. But then when I grew up, the space program ground to a halt. We haven't even been back to the moon in at least half a lifetime. There's no colony on Mars. We don't even have a viable flying car, even though I was promised all that stuff when I was a kid. Now, on the other hand, I do have a phone in my pocket that can outperform a computer that used to occupy like half a small building back the year I was born. The crew of the original Star Trek series had these big bulky communicators, if you remember, that didn't even have video screens. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but the Starship Enterprise actually had cathode ray tubes for screens. They didn't even anticipate LCD monitors. But now I have a device that fits in my pocket it lets me go to a virtual video meeting on the other side of the planet in real time, instantaneously, even if I happen to be standing in an empty field miles from my house. So it turns out it's, it's a funny thing, the future. There's just no way you can predict what's going to happen. And you can go running to the psychics all you want, but none of them can see the future either. In all of human history, there has only ever been one credible claim from someone who says he can see the future. And he can back that claim up with a 2,600 year track record of never missing a single prediction, not even one. Now here's what this individual says. It's in Isaiah chapter 46, starting in verse nine. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So on the one hand, you have God who never misses a beat. He never ever gets it wrong. He says he can see the future in absolute detail. And then you have someone like me, and I got almost everything wrong about my future. I mean, this life now, that is not what I was expecting as a kid. Now, I thought I was going to be one of the Dukes of Hazard growing up. Honestly, I thought that's where adulthood would take me. I would be defying the local sheriff in a hopped up Dodge Charger. Now, the truth is, I've already owned a minivan and I owned it before I even had kids. Now, what did happen is I managed to get kind of hairy like all the tough guys were on TV back in the 1970s, but turns out I'm a day late and a dollar short on that one because by the time I erupted and all my matted 
hairy, masculine glory. That movement was over and hairy guys weren't cool anymore. Now it turns out you don't want to look like Burt Reynolds anymore. <laughs> then to make matters worse, I discovered hair starts growing in places you really don't want it. And nothing, I'm telling you nothing, young guys, prepares you for the humbling moment when you're on the operating table and one of the nurses goes running for the clippers because she's seen what is growing on your back. Nothing can get you ready for the moment. They shear you like a sheep because you're that hairy. Now I find myself plucking hairs out of my earlobes and I've joined that long line of aging men who have had to visit their nostrils with those tiny little nose scissors. Look, I'm telling you, it's almost impossible to predict your life in detail. And from where I sit right now, almost nothing has turned out the way I thought it would. I have lived at 24 different street addresses in just over half a century. I have worked on every continent except one, and that's Antarctica. I'm an immigrant, like my father was. I'm a citizen of a country now I wasn't born into. And there was no way I could have predicted any of this. So I've got to say, there is no way that you can predict what being a parent is going to be like. I mean, you think you know, because you were once a child with parents yourself, but you have no idea. Listen to me, young people. <laughs> there was no predicting from the outset that my kids would think of a foreign country as their home, or that my childhood, which feels like it happened yesterday to me, well, it was going to be as remote and ancient to my kids as World War II was for me. I mean, think about this. I was born just 24 years after World War II, but it may as well be 2,400 years because it was a world I didn't know. And I could only see it through the stories my parents and grandparents told and through a bunch of black and white film footage. Now, that's how remote my childhood looks to my kids. The 70s are the 40s to them, and the 40s are as far back as the turn of last century as far as my kids are concerned. And it boggled their mind when they were little when I told my kids I actually knew people born in the 1800s. And then they find out my own grandfather was born more than a century ago. Here's the way I think about it. All of us are sitting on this cosmic conveyor belt that takes you from childhood to adulthood to middle age to old age, and then it kind of drops you off in the grave. Right? We're all on that conveyor belt. That's the part you can predict. But what's not predictable is how you're going to feel and how each of those different stages is going to present itself in your life. So, for example, there's no way to predict how suddenly your body is going to refuse to cooperate with you one day. Ah, you might, you might know it up here. You might know it intellectually. I mean, we all intellectually know that we're going to break down, we're all going to get old, and eventually your body just quits on you. But you won't know what it's like until it happens. And you hit this stage of life where maybe your aches and pains are going to get better. Maybe not. You know, something's going to happen eventually. Right? We all know it. Some kind of health crisis. But what in the world is it going to be that gets you? Kidney disease? Cancer? Stroke? Heart attack? Dementia? You have no idea. Now, I'm aware there are these tests now where they can tell you genetically what's likely to get you. But I gotta say, I've never wanted to do one of those because I don't really want to know. I don't want this sword of Damocles hanging over my head, ready to drop any day. I'd, I'd rather just be surprised when whatever it is that's going to get me actually happens. Because it all is just guesswork anyway, isn't it? Now, don't go away because I've, I've got to take a break and I want to pull this all together in a way that hopefully makes a bit of sense and show you I'm not just being a fatalist and a pessimist. What I'm talking about can be useful to you. I'll be right back. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. 
Now, if you've been listening to me for the last few minutes, you might be thinking, man, what a pessimistic fatalist. But honestly, I'm not. I'm just reminiscing on how often I've been wrong and how utterly incapable I seem to be of predicting the course of my life. Maybe you've done a little better. Maybe your life has been a carefully written script and you knew all your lines from the very beginning. But I'm guessing that's probably not true. Your your 10-year-old self could not have never predicted the way you are right now. I mean, not really. And maybe that's one of the reasons the Bible tells us to do two different things. On the one hand, it says to work hard, make plans, and chart a course for the future. But on the other hand, it warns you to be ready for all your plans to fall apart without a moment's notice because, as it turns out, you're just not in charge of much. Listen to what it says in James chapter 4. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Then you have these words from Jesus, Matthew 6. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So here's the problem that emerges when you choose to believe that you're actually in charge of your future, that you can plan everything out to the last detail. When it doesn't go the way you hoped, and I promise it won't, the anxiety that comes from losing control can be crippling. You lie awake at night wondering how you can salvage your plans and push everything back to where it's supposed to be. But a lot of the time you're going to find yourself incapable of fixing this. You might have planned a long and happy retirement with your spouse, but then one of you dies. You might have planned to live in a certain way in a certain place, but then the door suddenly closes and you see it's never going to happen. You might have dreamed of seeing your name in lights or making the New York Times bestseller list or playing an instrument to thousands in Carnegie Hall and then comes that horrible day when you realize none of it's going to happen, no matter how much you want it, because things happen that you can't control. And what you stand to lose at that moment is probably the most valuable gift that this life can hand you, peace of mind. Again, I'm not saying you shouldn't make plans or have goals because that would be a massive mistake. I want to be careful that we come away from this discussion not being hopelessly fatalistic. I mean, you can make plans and you should make valuable decisions. And you know that old age is probably coming and you should make plans for it now before you get there. I guess what I'm trying to say is this. Don't make a god of your plans because you'll have nothing left if things don't go the way you hoped. You know, one of the big things you can't possibly predict when you're a kid is that astonishing moment when you realize your parents were right. They actually knew what they were talking about. Now, there was no way for you to understand that as a kid because, well, you hadn't walked down the path of adulthood or parenthood yet. But now that you're older, you can look back and see things from their perspective and you suddenly discover, man, they were completely right. So that makes me wonder about the things that God tries to teach me. There are moments when I don't like it. Moments when what God says completely rubs my fur the wrong way. Man, that's not the way I think about it, God. What in the world are you doing to me? But you know, I suspect if I was suddenly given a glimpse from God's side of the story, from the perspective of somebody who always knows the end from the beginning, well, then I suspect I would suddenly realize, man, God is right. I mean, maybe that's one of the reasons that so much of this ancient book is a series of prophecies and predictions. I mean, when Jesus predicted his own death by crucifixion, he told his disciples, I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. They, the disciples, didn't know the future. There was no way they could. But when the future arrived, they could suddenly see that God did know it. So imagine planning life with somebody like this in your corner and discovering that he's always right every single time. It does mean swallowing your pride, but let's admit it. Life kind of has a way of breaking down your pride anyway. So what would it mean to stop worrying about your plans and waiting to see what God has in mind? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? 
Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers and guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. You know, I'm really not that old yet. I'm just a little over 50. But then the other day I was sorting through these old photos and organizing digital copies of everything and it suddenly struck me how few things have played out the way I, I thought they would. There was just no way to predict which moments would be the sweetest, which ones would hurt the most. I mean, I heard older guys talking about the bruises and scars they all picked up as they lived their lives, but I had no idea what they meant until I got a few scars of my own. And you logically know that loss is going to happen, but you have no idea what that means until it does. You lose your health, you lose your living, you lose a person you love. It's all just an intellectual exercise until it happens, and then you suddenly realize why the poets of every time and every place have struggled to put these things into words. But, but here's the thing. This life has actually given me far more than I thought it might. Yeah, it's been challenging, and I've spent years of my life clinging to the wheel with white knuckles, my teeth clenched. And this has been every bit as hard, every bit as painful as previous generations tried to warn us. But you know, at the same time, life has actually been merciful enough not to give me everything I asked for. And I've discovered that the real reward in life, as I've said already, it's not a particular destination. Mm -mm. The reward is found in just living it and discovering the only God who really understands what's going on. So, if my life were to come to an end right now, if I died as I walked out of studio, I've got to say, I couldn't have asked for any more. And if I do get another 30, 40 years, I can't wait to find out what God wants to teach me next because here's what I've discovered. You take this as your guide, you live this way, take its advice, you're going to get to the finish line, and you'll find your whole life has been authentic. You've done it right. Thanks for joining me. I'm Sean Boonstra. Thank you.